when it's in your family, when it's somebody that you have trusted, when it's somebody like a parent or an uncle or a grandfather, or a grandparent, and you are still dependent on them, and so you can't get out, the belief that you develop is that the world is an unsafe place. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Mislabeled. Um, if you guys are all wondering, first of all, yes, we are in our new studio. I don't know when this is coming out, but if you're wondering why there's a crappy sign behind us, it's because we are going to be getting a new one shortly. So everyone just be patient. It's going to be a lot more professional, but we're, we've been working on this very tediously over the last three, four weeks. Uh, thank God it's going very well. Um, at least I'm pleased with it. So oh, it uh, looks, it looks great. Zach, Zach is on board. I'm a big fan. Zach's a big fan. Okay, fine. So th that's, first of all, the quick update on that. Number two, if you're enjoying our content, please like, subscribe, and comment. Please jam the like button. You know what jam means? It means like, make sure it doesn't undo itself. Just an absolute jam. All right. Number three, this episode is brought to you by ENA Tax Advisors. ENA Tax Advisors is a tax strategy company that helps you limit your tax liability um, by structuring your taxes using a variety of financial instruments. Um, this is applicable for 1099 and W-2 employers. Um, so yeah, if this is something, if you feel that this is something you're interested in, please give them a quick call. I use them. They're fantastic. Um, and they give a free consultation. So if they cannot help you, they will tell you very quickly that, hey, we can't help you for whatever the reason is. They will, or they will just honestly give you advice. I know people that have called them that have straight up given them advice, not charged them anything because it wasn't a big enough job, so to speak, to help them. But nevertheless, they're good people. So uh, you can reach out. I use Ellie. He's fantastic. So you can reach out to him. Uh, the number should be displayed on the bottom of the screen. Okay. Now to our guest, Dr. Right? I got the right Dr. Trish Atia. Correct. And I know Dr. Trish Atia for now it's 11 years because when I first entered the field, you were a highly sought after and highly recommended person to get to, as a therapist. Like I remember doing my research. Yeah. You constantly came up, um, but you were too hard to get into. And I still remember speaking to you and asking you and, you know, you were just like, yeah, no room. Sorry. Um, I don't think as callous as that, but I'm just <laughs> telling you the basics of what happened. Um, and yeah, so I have heard that even afterwards, I've tried getting people I've recommended and it's always the same answer that you're full. Um, so that's typically the sign of a good therapist. <laughs> um, with that being said, uh, I know you're involved in our place. Right. Yes. And I want to thank, by the way, shout out Sonny Perlman for helping us make the shidduch. Um, what do you currently do for our place? I'm co-president of the board. So what's the structure? The board is compromised of how many people there? I think we have eight or nine people on the board, some of whom are very involved and some of whom are less involved, I think, like every other board. Got it. And you're highly involved. Quick beat. For those of us who do not, for those uh, listeners and viewers who do not watch our Sonny Perlman episode, what is our place? Okay, our place um, started about 20 years ago with a boys drop-in center in Flatbush for kids who had predominantly um, drug and alcohol problems, couldn't be home. Um, and then we added a girls drop-in center. Then we added the living room for people coming out of rehab, not wanting them to come back down the, uh, to the drop-in centers, right? We wanted a different kind of milieu, a recovery milieu for them. And so the living room opened also in Flatbush and now has branches in Long Island, out here. In it's right here, right, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't know Five Towns. Am I in Five Towns? You are in Five Towns and it's in Cedar. It's on Carmen Avenue, 91 Carmen Avenue, okay. I'm pretty sure. So that's, wow. two, that's a little No, room. I know people who go there and I one time randomly landed up there. Okay. Um, it happens to be thing. Personally, I'm not in recovery, right. but I ran random time. Well, it's pretty unique because um, people can find, obviously, AA and other 12-step programs, you know, anywhere. But finding them, you know, with the orientation towards working with the Jewish population and that everything is professionally led versus not led, which is when you go to a just meeting you find in the AA listing, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of Shabbatones and retreats and that kind of thing. And we expanded um, after Long Island, most recently to um, Florida, Hollywood. Really? 
so many Jews didn't move down there. I know. You know, um, New Yorkers. Yeah, especially yeah. with you know the ability to work remotely. Yeah, you know you can live somewhere with better weather, and still good food, and so you know, kosher food and good weather. I think people flock down there. We opened with forty members. We opened starting to start. Wow, yeah, that was the living room, and then um, we're also going to be opening. It's either Tom's River or one of the places outside of. Um, Lakewood. They need it for sure. Right. Guaranteed. Right. I'm just <laughs> promising you that Good right guess. now. Good guess. No. And uh, so that's that. And then I know Sonny told you about our village, which are yeah. the drop in centers and step up centers. And that's in Muncie, correct? And those are in Muncie. And so those are for, um, if I'm correct, older. Like that's uh, for like adult, like yeah. 20s, 30s. Yeah. I think, you know. Definitely over 18. They're not for younger mm -hmm. than 18. Uh, but it both Our Village and TLR are predominantly for people post rehab. Not exclusively, but, you know. I love what you guys have done. I mean, you built out an actual structure within the from community from beginning to end, it seems like. Right? You've, I mean, for teenagers all the way to coming out of recovery to giving them, right, not having them go backwards right. between yeah. all the programs, Our Place, Girls, Boys. Uh, obviously, Sonny Perlman's, you know, our village, uh, our right. village and then uh, the living room. I know Menachem Poznanski, who I'm friends with, is involved in it. Right. He is. I, I love Menachem. I think he's one of the wiser I people I've met. Yeah. Doesn't We've get been enough. really fortunate. We, we yeah. you know, Hashem's been really good to us. And we have we have done it grown kind of organically, you know, as a need presented itself. So we open up the next thing versus having some sort of corporate structure. Oh, well, that's not nice. That's also not nice because that means there, there's just a need in a lot of places. You know, it is what it is. But, you know, thank God there's people that are taking care of that need or seeing that need. Yeah, thank you. So can I ask a question? What are you seeing? Uh, this is always a curious question to me, and I ask this to a lot of people. What are you seeing in the in the firm community with these teenagers, right? What's the, the common denominator of these teenagers who are having a very difficult time at 14, 15, 16 years old? Well... It's interesting that it, it, it's changed over 20 years, right? Um, we are seeing, um, I would say, more mental health in addition, mental health issues in addition to addiction issues, whereas initially, you know, when we opened, it was primarily addiction. Um, similarities over the last 20 years would be significant um, family strife and, and issues at home. Um, we're also fortunate today that there are yeshivas uh, to work with these kids, which there weren't 20 years ago. You know, have Waterbury and I'm forgetting the one in uh, Lakewood. I'm blinking, but you know, there there is more support in general. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's some of the changes that I've noticed. Wow. So got it. Um... I would say I'll just throw this out. Our CSO, um, and he's also our CEO and CFO, um, says and has noticed, because he's been around from the beginning, that he finds the kids less able to engage, that they are much more on their cell phones and doing Xboxes or things that like that. Sense, and so it's a little bit harder. It takes a little longer to engage them because in the past, before we had all of that, they would come in and so ping pong or, you know, even watching sports or something like that, there's more engagement right. than these more solitary activities. I, go ahead. Do you think the mental health issue is related a lot to the social media and cell phone age like that we're in right now? Interesting. I don't know. Because I, I it used to just be addiction that. and now mental, I feel like, again, I don't know, I always talk about this, but mm. I think it's like when I'm talking to friends privately, I like, I literally, literally believe social media is just the death of the world. I think it's just mm. taking over. It's fueling insecurity, fueling people who don't belong, having opinions, having them. Yeah. Um, Please follow us on Instagram and TikTok, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> no, but really, I, I think. Nice opportunity. Yeah. 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 I saw, I saw an opening. <laughs> and I also want to say mazel tov on your new space. It's I really appreciate nice. that. Yeah. You yeah. like it? I love it. Yeah. Um, I always expect to be in somebody's, you know, living room with their, you know, 
dirty cups sort of sitting around somewhere. So it's nice to be in a space we were, that's really professional. We threw all the dirty cups into a closet right before you got it. Appreciate that. And we were talking about my perfectionism and other problems before uh, you got here even, before the pod started. So let's just go into it. What, what are you seeing right now? <laughs> Based on the studio yeah, setup. You thought you were coming for an interview. This is actually a th intervention, therapeutic intervention for Excellent. label. Excellent. Yeah. We're going to try to make him not perfectionist. Yeah, we're going to try. It would help all of us, really. It, really? <laughs> no, you know what? No, his perfectionism is why we have this They've nice studio. they tried it, in fairness, for 11 years. They have not been successful. <laughs> right. So the type of therapy that I do is called somatic IFS. And so mm. we would say... That there's no, all parts, we love all parts, including your perfectionistic part. And it would only be a problem if it took over and didn't give you access to yourself or Nisham. So can, we, can you just explain for people that are not familiar, partially myself, if I'm being totally honest, to the concept specifically of IFS? I know it's a parts-based therapy, but could you just explain what that means? And then specifically somatic on top we'll of that. We'll get to that yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there are books written on this. So you want me just to sum it up? Um, Most people don't read these days. <laughs> okay. Well, could, would you be able to sum it up in a way that would pique someone's interest to go read those books? So IFS um, is about the belief that we each have a core self, the neshama, and that core self is calm and clear, conscious, compassionate, courageous, curious, um, creative, maybe I left out a C. And so that dovetails um, with the idea of the neshama. So it's pure and it's how we were made. And over time, as we mature, grow up, uh, parts build up. And so there are feeling parts and there are protector parts. And I, I use that as an in-show because you spoke about your perfectionism. And so IFS would work with any parts that you presented and help you have a relationship with those parts. And you would have to notice perhaps if that part sometimes got in the way of anything, but most parts are, all parts are useful, important, helpful. When we're dealing with trauma, which is my specialty. Right, I was going to ask that. Right. My specialty is survivors of incest and childhood sexual abuse. And parts that were used to help people survive. Um, when these people become adults, those parts are generally in the way. But they were critical to survival. So our systems are hesitant to give up something that helped us survive. But now is a detriment to us. Now is, is getting in the way, is blocking the self, right. blocking clarity, blocking compassion, blocking people from moving forward in it's their lives. It's playing defense. It's playing defense and there's, yeah. there's no longer anything to protect you from, so it's just getting in the way. Right, and these are protector parts. Yeah. And so we have to work with them very and is gently. And is that where the love comes in? Because you were saying that you treat them with love. Passion. Yeah. It's hard, someone could hear that and be like, well, I don't love my perfectionism. I don't love my anger. Exactly. But you have to love it because you don't, it doesn't mean you have to enjoy the fact that it makes you angry or that it makes you perfectionist. You're loving it because it's really just trying to protect you. Right, and if, if there's a you and this part, then already there's a separation that's really healthy. And then I can be with the part that's been protecting me so long. And it, over all these years, I've noticed this part, but I, I'm angry with it or I've squashed it because it gets in the way of things that I want to do. So I'll say to people, and how's that working for you? Because what happens is as we try to squash it, the energy, self-energy that should be in self, right? gets actually transferred and used to suppress all these parts. And then the system also doesn't learn how to be with them. So when they do pop up, they're stronger than ever. And we don't have our bodies, our systems don't have, you know, the knowledge about how to be with them. So when we can appreciate them, connect to them, find them in our bodies or around our bodies, accept them, then they tend to chill out and then we find, oh, they have a very useful place in our overall system I today. Definitely, I definitely need IFS. You definitely need <laughs> <laughs> I convinced you. You sold me. Done. 
<laughs> and to be clear, you talk about these parts, these what the parts that people are having negative experiences with because they're getting in the way as not it's a good thing to see distance between the parts and let's say me. Like I'm me, right. I'm self with a capital S, I'm Nishama, I'm and then that isn't me, but it's part of the system. Correct. But it's not me. It's part of your system, but the separation creates the ability for you to be with it. So if you are blended with it, this is IFS terminology. If you are blended with it, then there's no you and there and and so you can't be with it. It's you're the same. overcome, you're angry, or you're living in perfection. But maybe I'm maybe I'm beating a dead horse here, but like how is it not you? It's it's, it's a piece it's, of you. It's a piece of you. It's a right. it's an aspect. So right. I'm getting maybe I'm getting too technical, but like is is the self like kind of behind all those pieces? So think about you this we want to lead an embodied life. And as we lead an embodied life, the embodied self makes decisions in consultation with the parts. Can you say that once more? Right. We want to lead an embodied life and we want the embodied self with all those C's to be able to make decisions and move forward in life after consultation with its parts. Got it. So, so think of it as a system. And that's how we'd like our systems to operate. Got it. Could you go get into the somatic aspect? So I already have by using the word embodied. embodied. Right. Got it. So um, Susan McConnell um, worked with Dick Schwartz, who is the founder of IFS, and she added the current somatic pieces that are in IFS. So a typical IFS question might be, where are you noticing that part in or around your body? And so that, you know, is the somatic. And there's other pieces. Susan, much more recently, maybe just three or four years ago, wrote a book. She had been doing it longer called Somatic IFS. And so there's a lot more of the practices of somatic practices once we've identified a part. So it's a more embodied practice, which brings it even less cognitive. So I think IFS moved us away from talk therapy and analysis and this moves us further away from talk therapy and analysis. What is what are your thoughts on talk therapy as far as the effectiveness of it versus somatic yeah. or IFS? Yeah. I I believe in somatic IFS. I don't want to there's so many people that are really committed to analysis and talk therapy and cognitive therapies and all of that. So I don't want to upset people. And so I'll just say what I believe in, if that's okay. Got it. And was this always your opinion or is this something yeah. that's a new thing? No, I mean, I tried everything um, and landed on something that works the best to relieve people who are really suffering. Is this a new thing I'm saying over the last seven to 10 years? No, IFS has been around a very long time. 90s, right? But because I think 80s. So why is, it it the, why is it the new in thing? Because since it was called internal family systems, I'm sure people like me ignored it for 20, 30 years because we don't do family therapy. And so we didn't pay any attention to it. So the name, you know, led a lot of us to, just not pay any attention to it. So why is it called that if it's a part-based therapy? You could read Dick Schwartz's book, but I think he initially conceived of these parts as almost your little internal family. Got it. Mm -hmm. I, that is not a current emphasis, but remember, I think it's 70s or 80s. Like it's really a long time wow. ago it's, that it's been around. I also, it's some, something interesting to note. I, I got recently into IFS um, in the past two years is it, I mean, even just the way that you were just talking about it, I think we can all agree it has a very spiritual connotation. Exactly. I mean, you 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 basically identified the self that Dick Schwartz talks about, where exactly. you're finding that that calm, compassionate self as the neshama. And that I can, don't know if he defines it that way, but I'm not Susan, sure Susan does. Susan In does. Susan's book, she and calls it the ruach. Well. But uh, yeah. And yeah. I think that that could turn some people off. It could that's turn right. some people very on. They could be like, oh, that's exactly what I want. And right. some some other people they could be like, oh, what's this heebie-jeebie stuff? Right. And I think it's very interesting to know, just from my, when I looked into IFS, Dick Schwartz was an atheist when he created IFS. I'm not sure that's changed. He said that he, 
I, I saw in an interview that he said he has now come to some understanding of, of some un, some sort of belief in a higher power or in a human soul okay. because after just seeing this modality that he created and what it does and what it seems to point to logically. Um, it's just an interesting, it's, but right. I guess you you don't need to be religious or un, or unreligious to to do IFS, but right. it but seems to dovetail I, with certain I find beliefs. That I just got back from a somatic IFS retreat in Costa Rica, which was amazing. And I, I find more and more the therapists that are, you know, attracted to it have a pretty significant spiritual side to them because I don't think they would come to maybe more than one presentation of somatic IFS if they didn't have that. It's just my guess. I could be wrong. In case I'm missing something, so how was he an atheist if he created this? Like well, you're telling me everyone who follows it no, is so like- He created the self. Susan's book used Ruach and Get it. I think it's right. more- spiritual. You don't need to come to a belief in souls or an afterlife or anything, Correct. but just talking about like, listen, right. the human personality right. is made yeah, up of these parts just, and a self. You could call it self. And what I always check out to see where my clients are holding in terms of their feelings about Yiddishkeit, Judaism, Neshama, before I would call it that. So I might mm. start out just with self. And then as I get to know them a little bit more, because I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable or press some buttons if they themselves suffered some sort of spiritual that Sounds like abuse. you're a good therapist. I've, I wish I've had some therapists who checked in with uh, <laughs> my understanding of those concepts. Yeah, yeah. That's, that. that's fascinating though. So uh, one question. So you're seeing obviously lots of kids from our place. You're very involved in this. What, so no. You're not. No. Not just either. the board. So in my private practice, as I have gotten older, so have my clients. And um, really when it comes to today, teenagers, I did for that for 20 years. So the midnight phone calls, they ran away from rehab, the, the constant collateral contacts with their rebellion and their parents and the ER visits and the overdoses. I am now turning that over to the younger therapists. So I don't work with so many of those kids anymore. My, I generally work with people who are survivors. And so that is more like 30s, 40s. 50s, 60s. Could you describe the difference between someone who survived incest or sexual abuse from just the typical trauma of someone who didn't? Like the effects of that person and the seriousness of that, that experience. Oh, okay. Um, so there are a lot of medical problems. Um, Such as? Which speaks to the body. Well, the CDC, believe it or not, uh, which we generally think of as the, you know, as, as an agency that deals with COVID, right? And, you know, those kinds of things. Center for Disease Control did a study not so many years ago that showed that um, people who have sexual abuse histories um, have higher rates of, and they listed like 20 illnesses. So mm. all sorts of autoimmune plus cancer plus the things we you know, normally think about anxiety, depression, but the medical was, was really a, um, a, a big, you know, shock for me, even though I believe in body and mind, it speaks even more deeply to it, that trauma survivors have so many more medical issues. And that's like the body keeps the score concept. Exactly. You know, exactly. Um, got it. So that's one difference. Um, you know, obviously these are people, you know, suffering, all sorts of, you know, different anxieties, depressions, problems in relationships. Yeah, I was going to ask, what are the typical problems symptoms? Problems with sexuality. Okay. Um, problems with suicidality. I mean, it's kind of across the board, you know. There's really, you know, when when it's in your family, when it's somebody that you have trusted, when it's somebody like a parent, um, or an uncle or a grandfather, or a grandparent, that you it is supposed to be taking care of you and you are still dependent on them. And so you can't get out. The belief that you develop is that the world is an unsafe place 
no one can be trusted. I'm alone. I'm vulnerable. And that's never going to change. Well, how do you begin to change a belief like that? We, we talked um, to Sonny about this. By validating it. By, val okay. by, by working and then maybe working with that younger kid. One of the things um, that people think of, I think, as um, uh, inner child work, but one of the pieces of this practice is perhaps at some point spending time with your younger self and trying to do some healing with that younger self um, to help them, um, not by telling them, hey, everything's going to be okay, but by being there with them and validating them. So as a piece of IFS, the inner child, because I always got an understanding that it was like part of a piece of the practice, the way it's practiced is that one way in is working with your, your child self or your younger self. Got it. That's a piece of the <laughs> potential treatment. Um, I feel like there's kind of two roads in. So one is through the body and one is through working with the younger self. And um, I have clients that do both. I have clients that prefer one or another. Um, but this isn't what happens day one. The first part is it does take some time to help people become somatically aware, which that's Susan's first practice, somatic awareness. Like, how can I help you be more embodied? How can I help you connect? Because most of us live in our heads, right? Yeah, I suck at this particular thing. So, no, I've tried like somatic therapy. It just does not work for me. So what does that mean that I'm not in touch? I don't know where the pain is in my body, just to clarify that. It means that. you're very normal because a lot of people are live like in their brains. Oh, yeah. I know. I'm in my brain all day, but yeah. I just want to know what should change. If you wanted to change and you'd like to become more into your body, we would try to help you do that. Like, for example, and people who come into my office are pretty surprised to see yoga mats and back checks. And, and you know, if they choose, they can lie down. Um, lying down is grounds your whole body and you can often feel that support. And then we, you know, see so your breath right now is getting a little deeper. And so we could help you, you know, with the breath with your body and just as long as you know you're interested in that and then we understand that protector parts like the brain um may pull you away from that and then we would work with those protector parts too all parts welcome and dick schwartz's latest book um for lay people versus more like a textbook is called no bad parts and so it's really short and cute and I think helpful for people who want kind of an IFS introduction. No, no bad parts. No bad parts. You you mentioned something very interesting a little, just a little bit ago about when we we're talking about the inner child that you, you said that the best thing you can do is to validate is not to like reassure it, not to reassure yourself. Everything. I think that's what a lot of people do when they're in a very stressful situation is they try to self soothe. They calm themselves down in their head. They're saying the words, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And you did not say that. You didn't say tell it. You said, well, it let wasn't it. wasn't okay. So why are we going to lie and say it's going to be okay? You're working, let's say, with your six-year-old self that's being abused and tortured. And that's going to go on for another four years. So you're going to meet, you're going to connect with that younger self and say it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay for a long time. Would you say this is true even with less extreme cases where it's not, let's say, you know, something horrible like sexual yes. abuse, even if it's just your basic garden variety trauma yeah. and, you, and someone finds yeah. themselves as an adult not dealing with stress well, instead of trying to tell yourself like, oh, it's going to be okay. Just being like, hey, buddy, you're really stressed right now. And that makes total sense. And Correct. then you just sit with it. Like Correct. And anxiety and stress actually are the easiest ones to find in your body because they're ramped up. Like anxiety, stress, anger. Those are all kind of above, we call it above the window of tolerance, above the line. A little harder sometimes for people to find kind of the more like depression, frozen. Depression has a place the in the body? Well, people often describe it as there's something heavy or my heart's hurting, but it takes a little more time to find it. Whereas these, anybody that's ever had anxiety can tell you racing heart, uh, uh, my breath is fast, I'm feeling a little hot. You know, I'm just saying those are kind of more familiar to right. people. Yeah. Right. I also think a part of maybe what got confusing and got confusing to me too, was that we're talking 
in the current moment, I think it's okay, tell me if I'm wrong, to say that it's going to be okay, right? It's more when you're going back to your child self. Is no, that, that you shouldn't say that? I would never tell a client that it's going to be okay. Well, that's because you can't know. I'm talking about for me, myself. Uh, if I'm working, right, I'm in a tough, difficult situation. It's been a long couple of months, a long day, whatever it is. I'll a lot of times tell myself, like, it's going to be all right. Like, there's nothing like... I have confidence within myself to walk through whatever it is that will come my way. Yeah. So it'll be okay. Now, if I'm working on my seven-year-old self, well, I know that it wasn't okay. Right. So I wouldn't lie to myself. And, right. And, and right. Pretend. So you would agree that it's a smart thing to say to your current self, it's going to be okay. Well, you know, reassuring our parts that everything's going to be okay is obviously important. And we will, I think we will do that. We're entering a situation and we've entered it before and it's been okay in the past. It'll, you know, be okay in the future. And we reassure ourselves what we would try to avoid doing from a clinical perspective is if there are parts that are worried, I also, cause I'm, I'm reassuring. So I'm assuming there's a worried part. So I still want to validate that. Got I it. still want to say, I understand you're worried because there's a lot going on right, right. now and you're really busy but, and you know, yeah. And on top of Pesach, there's this, and you're going to see that. And I, I hear all of that and I'm, but, and, and not, but, and mm. once it's taken that in, right. I would say, you know, in our, in our relationship together, we get through these things and I'm going to be with you and that'll help us move forward. So Got that's it. a reassurance of a part possibly. Very cool. It's very, very interesting space there. I like it. So the new in thing right now, right, is obviously psychedelics. Ayahuasca. Yes. I mean, it's, it is the thing. Yes. Right. Where are you on this whole entire topic? I mean, I saw a lot of people on this for the most part, it seems like 99% are like, bro, go do ayahuasca. That that's how much, that's how annoyed they are at hanging out with me. They're all just like, bro. <laughs> Just go to ayahuasca, just save us. <laughs> right. To but, spend 10 minutes labels like, wow, dude, I'll book the ticket to the <laughs> island right now. Where do whatever I you got want. you? We'll, we'll go together. I'll even go with you. <laughs> right. You know, the person who you might want to have on here that really seems who, who's my go-to person is Michael Landau. He's really, and he knows somebody on your team. You said maybe. Maybe it's Shmuley Warren. Okay. It's the only person I can think of. I, he, um, and, and he is really, I just actually called him this morning. I had a question about psychedelics and do you use that with people who have addiction? Because like, hey, how does that work? So he's my go-to person. So you might want to have him on here. He's really well versed in that. What I've done is, um, I had my own ceremony. You did. I did, but I did it with a therapist who, after three prep meetings, uh, two prep meetings, decided the best thing for me was a, a combo of MDMA and psilocybin, which is mushrooms. And then afterwards, there were three um, integration sessions where we three. integrated. Yeah, two prep, three integration. That's a good program. Two prep. And three integration after the ceremony, which was about five hours. Three, meaning you came back three days in a row? After you took you know, the MDMA. I did, I did Zoom, Zoom for the next couple of weeks, three times for wow. integration sessions. My hope is that one day when it's legal, I can do it in my practice. Then I don't have prep to do because I already know. You just people. admitted to a crime on, on this podcast. I did. <laughs> can I just ask a question? Sorry. You did three therapy sessions beforehand. Two. Two prep. Two prep. Then you did the MDMA and psilocybin ceremony ceremony. And what happened afterwards? Then there were three integration sessions. What the, what's an integration session? Well, you've just had this experience. And so you're meeting with this person to kind of integrate it, to talk about it, to see, you know, where things are for you. Um, so that it's not just an isolated experience and it doesn't become integrated into your life. Got it. So you're saying so you could take with you in a positive way whatever you experienced. Right. Label. Chazar Sashir. It's like Chazar. It's like, yeah, I got it's it, like I you got, got a share. Yeah, you're yeah, the Chazar yeah, yeah. So, so here's my question. So first of all, how was that experience for you? Beginning to end? It was great. It was. I, I really, I really enjoyed it. I, I would also just put out there from a, um, I don't know, balance perspective that my retreat in Costa Rica went deeper. 
and will have a longer impact on my life. And I'm putting that out there because too often, I think, in our world, we jump on something as the answer. Right. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when we thought psychotropic medication was going to be the best we could empty out and did uh, many of the psychiatric long-term treatment centers because that was going to be the answer. So there isn't an answer. And so I just wanted to give that comparison. Like I had a great experience with that, but deeper and more long-lasting will be the retreat in. And that Australia. retreat was IFS? That was somatic IFS. Somatic, yes. sorry. So non the retreat in Costa Rica, I'm sorry, maybe I'm missing something here. What was the retreat in Costa Rica again? Oh, that you just came back from. Yeah. Right. Somatic so, IFS retreat for therapists. Right. And yeah. how long did that, was that retreat? Right. So that's a week. Yeah. So, you know, it's this very deep experience. And I'm just saying that because there's not one answer. And I right. kind of wanted to put that out there. I think I, I think some people would look at psychedelics, especially with all the very promising research. And be, it, it seems so much easier than having to do the really hard work of like oh, a week of months of IFS and, and talk therapy and you're saying I could just do five grams of shrooms and like, I won't hurt anymore. Like, yeah, let's do that. And it's like, that's oh, not yeah. probably no, going to happen. It's been really good. I have um, 11, 11 clients, I think at this point that have done ayahuasca. I was going to ask you, what, why the have you done ayahuasca actually? I was thinking of doing ayahuasca, but I, I wanted to go to a woman, not so a man. Women don't do ayahuasca. Don't I don't know, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, you sure know, I don't, I'm sure there are, but not locally. I, I know the local people and they're all men. So I wasn't comfortable that way. And then when I heard about this, I'm, so I was already looking, I was thinking maybe I can find somebody like somewhere out West. I thought about um, a nice place to do ayahuasca might be um, um, Sonoma. Uh, no, not Sedona, Sedona, not Sonoma. Is that in Arizona? Yeah. And it's Red Rock and there's, Supposedly yeah. vortex is there anyway. Felt like a really cool place to do. So I was really looking. And then I found out about this, you know, um, ability to do it in New York with a therapist. And I was like, oh, this is going to really make a lot of sense to me. Now, you've been in the mental health scene for a long time. Did you, 20 years ago, if, if someone told you like, yeah, you were going to be doing like still kind of illegal, like MDMA and psilocybin therapy and ayahuasca, like, and, and not only that, it's going to be widely accepted and, and, and have a green uh, stamp of approval from therapists. Would you have laughed in their face? No, because I went to college in the seventies. <laughs> also in the seventies, nice. what was it called? Nice. <laughs> uh, there was a huge drug that's coming back to life now. What's it called? I'm blanking. LSD? Uh, no, 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 no. What's it called? There's, they're introducing it now to, 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 in therapies, I know. Ketamine. Yeah, ketamine. Yeah, ketamine is becoming a huge thing. I don't remember ketamine being big at all. Well, they banned it at a point. Like, Well, it, was, it wasn't when I was in college. We uh, didn't, I mean, did ketamine. I think it's it's almost cosmically funny that we live in a timeline where people are doing horse tranquilizers for fun and for healing. <laughs> right. Well, that's a, it's interesting. That's yeah. the line. And I think part of, for me, why I was comfortable doing this with a therapist was it, you know, she has training. I'm getting trained. Um, I'm taking. To do with this. A course it's uh, through an organization. I'll which, be licensed which in organization? Oregon. It's called Maps? Fluence. Oh, Fluence. No, MAPS doesn't have what I was looking for. Uh, I'll be, I'll get it if I finish this. It's very rigorous. I'll be certified in Oregon, which will mean nothing for now. But at some point, you know, oh, maybe it's legal they'll be rest in Oregon. It's the only place you can get a license is right. somewhere where it's legal. So uh, I'll pursue that for now and well, it's uh, such a, be it's, ready. It's such a weird time. Like, yeah. like she's getting, a, 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 you know, a legal in Oregon. <laughs> Honestly, it makes sense a little bit. Like, it's not so crazy to me at all. It, just in the sense of like, I don't know, like even when I, on a very, on a much lower level, like when I smoke weed and I don't do it all the time, but I smoke probably once every two weeks, right? Roughly before Shabbos or something about a long week. I don't explain it. I'm clearer thought. I come, I'm much more relaxed. Now I'm not saying that that's, you know, the answer at all. I'm oh, just saying no, that I see sure. the effects that it has personally when I, like my body slows down, I breathe. It's very much needed. So yeah, I, I could see how technically something that's much more, uh, mind expanding and, and, you know, could really allow you to see back and, and right. clear up your brain. Well, there's, you know, from what I'm understanding, the different um, 
medicines, trying to use the right lingo, um, affect our brains differently. And at least the therapist who worked with me, she picked both the types and the dosages based on her training and based on knowing what I needed. And so, um, you know, there's a lot to know. I, I'm the, this, the course that I'm taking is really, I'm not passing all the tests that I'm taking the first time. Like, you know, you read, you listen, and then you take these tests and you know, it's, it sometimes takes me a few times to really understand the biology of how each of these substances work. So, So, you know, it's It's thorough. You're saying it's not just a guessing game. Yeah. And and that's very different than like, Hey, I'm going to go do ayahuasca somewhere. This is a very different process. Yeah, no, I totally hear that. I'll, I'll be straight with you. Like the ayahuasca thing to me, um, like it makes sense once, twice. I hear people going for ayahuasca every other night. I'm just like, I, I, I don't understand this. To me, it's just the next drug that people are on. Right. Uh, and, and I spoke with other people and they're like, it has, you know, diminishing effects okay. because you're always looking for that next high from the ayahuasca and the clarity that the initial ayahuasca uh, trip gave you. So like it, it's. Ca- hmm. I have, uh, my clients have not. I mean, they've gone and some of them have gone again after six months. Right. And there's been some lasting changes and it's been helpful. I wouldn't say it's like, again, changed my life. No, it's not what these things right. are going to do. And people need to have, I think. They help, you know, but they're not going to panacea all of your problems. Right. I think they, you know, they maybe drop certain um, defenses that we have and right. give us some clarity. Um. Yeah. But, you know, it's not like a panacea for everybody. Got it. Right. Moving back before. So w- when you were doing this, right, uh, specifically uh, dealing with the teens in our place, et cetera, yes. was there a, a common denominator as far as the homes they were coming from, the relationship with their parents, uh, specific parenting tips and, and things that you were seeing within the way these kids were growing up, they were leading Especially like the off the derech crisis, as they call it, has been like a very like right. Everyone's trying to figure out the reason, the thing. Um, was there anything specific that you've seen? More divorced homes, more. I did not issue? see that. I did do my dissertation on this group when I was um, to get my PhD, um, but it was a small number of people. Believe it or not, when I did this, there was zero books and articles out there because today there's like TV shows and you know, this is all the rage, the whole OTD thing. There was zero, which is why I wound up doing qualitative research instead of quantitative because there was nothing written. So that's just think about in, um, you know, 20 years, how far, uh, it's actually a little longer now, 24 years, how far, you know, knowledge about this has come. I can tell you that, um, it is it is a very hard decision to make to leave the orthodox community you are leaving everything you know behind um depending on if you came you know maybe from a more hasidic background you're heading out into a world where you don't speak the language you don't have skills so it's a very difficult decision to make. And why I think that's important to start with is because it means that if someone leaves something seriously wrong, right. to take that step yeah. and leave everything you know, something is seriously wrong. I, you know, it's not, I mean, I just want to laugh when these people say, yeah, it's a uh, social media. It's, no, it's not. Something went wrong. Yeah. Something seriously went wrong at home, consistently in yeshiva. Something really serious. These are not kids who are like, hey, I think I want to have a good weekend and a fun time. It's funny because um, my first therapist, you know, said to me, he's like, he said to me back in the day that he's like kids that are going off the dark and it was pretty big in the probably, you probably know what it is. I'm sure you do back in the like nineties writing on this stuff. He was like, when you see a kid, people think like 
you know, it's easy for a kid who's 16, 17 to just shave off his pants and just go into the totally modern lifestyle where everyone is looking at this kid and being like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, if someone is taking that action and, you know, which he knows everyone's going to look at him like he's crazy, like whatever. Yes. And he's taking that action at 16, 17 years old. There's something there, that kid is in tremendous amount of pain. So to look at him and be like, you know, whatever, we have to do this and that to him to get him back on all these aggressive measures. You're totally missing the boat of what this kid is actually going through. So right. it sounds like you're saying a little bit of a similar thing. Yeah. And that's what we've learned at our place. Um, just love them. And many rebellion, obviously, in the last 25 years, we've seen a major shift right. uh, from ripping your shirt and going into mourning right. to an unconditional love and acceptance, not necessarily of what they do, but of them as people from being really open and understanding and would, loving. Would you say that res there's more respect now? Because this, this is something that I, I think needs to be talked about more in in the uh otd talk is you don't a parent specifically does not need to like what their kid's doing but you have to respect the decision and the fact that you're not you're, you're not your kid and your kid's not you especially if they're an adult for a teenager let's say they're 18 like that's an adult and you need to respect another adult's autonomy and their ability to make decision um so i work with parents um, through mask. I don't know if you know the mask agency. They again started out with parents um, whose kids are, were doing drugs and alcohol. And, and now they uh, do parents whose kids are fill in the blank. I don't know. I've never prioritized respect. I'll have to give that some thought, but compassion and um, I think when acceptance. teenagers do something against the, their community and their parents, isn't there a serious struggle for autonomy usually? I mean, talk to any teenager or anyone who used to be a teenager who th the same thing comes up every time of like, man, they were just, I felt like my whole life was being controlled. They wanted me to be a certain way and I just wanted to be a different yeah. way. Like yeah. there is a certain, there's a struggle for autonomy of yes. like, see me as a human being that is able to yeah. make decisions for myself. 100%. So that's why I just think respect is. Right, um, right. Um, yeah. Because respect doesn't mean like. Doesn't mean you have to even approve. Yeah, yeah. But it means back off to understand a certain extent. where they're coming from. You know, it's not crazy. They, you know, they. I think, yeah, I think that's really important to, you know, get to know them as people. Uh, some people in the field will say, "Pretend it's your neighbor's kid, yeah, not yours," right? Mm -hmm. And then you could say, "Tell me what's going on for you," instead of ah, you know. Rabbi Shia Cohen, I don't know if you know, I think I've said this on the pod before. He says that if only everyone could trade each other's kids, all the kids would come out normal. Right. Because <laughs> right? right. everyone's no game but never and, and biased with their own yeah. kids. You know, we just make stupid decisions because we, we want our, probably our own insecurities, honestly, because we're so worried. And well, love, I would um, assume, yeah, too. Yeah, I think we fear. get, you know, it's parents. Fear out of love. Fear and, um, you know, when we, with Judaism in particular, our belief is not just this is a, a good way to lead your life, but we believe that this is the way to lead your life. So then we see our kids as drowning without this. And so parents can, from that fear place, as you mentioned, start out like, I got to save my kid. I got to get that. Right. You know, so it's obviously approaching everything with the, I'll combine it now, with the fear part leading would not be a great approach. Right? working with kids now correct me if i'm wrong though but our place according to sunny when we talked to sunny does not have an agenda of let's make these kids religious again Absolutely. at all that is not the agenda it's 100%. let's make these kids not kill themselves right our goal is to provide love a loving and safe place for people that otherwise would be would not experience love or safety what has been the um outcome of that despite understanding that you have no agenda for that, like any mm. particular outcome. What have you seen happen when you, know, you happen to be doing this? You mean from a returning to Yiddishkeit perspective? Anything for oh. that matter. I don't know. Well, and, you know. Well, let's start with it from a return yeah, to Yiddishkeit. Yeah. So we have not kept stats on that for a particular reason. It's not our agenda. And if we did keep stats on that, then that would mean it was our agenda. Right. <laughs> right. So what we have kept stats on are people who Still alive. <laughs> She's still alive. Yeah, it's not a joke. We've lost people. Oh, God. Yeah, of course. Of course. You do keep saying that. Yeah, I guess it makes sense. Um, 
people who have returned to, you know, who are, who can work, people right. who have, you know, gone back to school, no people drugs. who have, you know, Pulled stayed sober. clean people, yeah. you know, those, Sonny would be the right one to ask about that. Right. I don't, you know, I'm on the board, not really involved so much day to day. Right. Right. Um, a couple other things that I definitely want to get to here. So there seems to be this major, obviously in the last 20 years, therapy, all this stuff has really gone to the forefront of society. And there's a major focus on trauma, right? You are the trauma person. Okay. Um, and there's big T trauma and little T trauma, right? That's what they refer to it as. Yes. I'm, but, I struggle a little bit with that. But could you explain what they refer to yeah, when they say that? Yeah. Uh, that what they, I think they meant was that little T trauma would be something like um, you were really neglected at home. Your emotional needs weren't met. You were ignored. You Your feelings were not taken into consideration. You were just, you know, one of a bunch of kids and, you know, I, I there you was, got lost in the shuffle. You got everything. lost in the shuffle. Yeah. You were probably a quieter kid and not somebody who made trouble that people would pay attention to. So the idea was that that kind of person with a lot of neglect, um, whose emotional needs were not attended to, but who wasn't physically or sexually abused, they would call that little T trauma. They might call losing a parent, um, a divorce at an early age, a fire in the home when everybody got out safely a bad car accident. These were the things that people referred to as little T Trump. Uh. I struggle with it because um, if the implication is that they're not suffering or they're not suffering as much or they're going to get better quicker, it's not true. So I would be hesitant today. I have used those terms, but I wouldn't today. Interesting. Um, what do you think? Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts specifically on today's generation, I ask this pretty much every time we have a therapist on because it's something that I am extremely curious about. Um, there is grit that is needed in life. There is toughness, in my opinion, that is needed in life. Life is not always going to be kind to anyone. Um, and if you want to be successful in, in really any, whatever you define success as, right, whatever it is, you're going to need uh, some grit and some toughness to make it through. Where do you see the, do you feel that there's too much coddling in today's day and age and there's an oversensitivity that is focused on or a lack of really, even if we want to pay attention to it and validate it, a lack of being able to tell people, hey, you still got to make this work, you know, and, and take accountability for your life. Do you feel that there's any of that these day and ages? I think the biggest gift that parents can give to children is a really positive sense of self-esteem. Start to build that core self, right? Because even though Hashem gives it to us very young, it's very immature. Right. It's a baby's. When parents love unconditionally and, you know, kid draws on a piece of paper and the parents call it a Picasso and they call Bobby and Zadie to come over and take a look, the kid is integrating all of these things. I am lovable. I have talent. I can accomplish unconditional positive regard, love and acceptance, giving all of that prior to age up until not, not that, not you stop, but is especially important up until like six, eight, because then you have a solid foundation and that is the solid foundation that will help you meet any challenge that Hashem throws your way. Got it. And, and in the world where that challenge wasn't met, let's say, right? There's a lot of people that are now 30, 40, 25, that at the end of the day, that wasn't given to them. Let's say a plenty amount of, a tremendous amount of people. Yeah. Because this wasn't common knowledge, especially 30 years ago. So you basically got the shit beat out of you, right? For lack of better terms, if you were four and you didn't stop crying. So now you're 25, right? And you're trying to move forward in your life. What is the, you see a lot of people that there's two mindsets. Some people, and I assume it's some balance in the middle, but some people are like, Jay, just tough it up. Some people are very of the mindset, like it, it, what turns into a little bit of a victim mindset, some would call it. And, you know, that makes it much in, in ways I could understand why that makes it more difficult to succeed because, right. You're always, you're not coming from a place of power, not power, power is the wrong word. It's just, 
it's kind of the way a lot of things went. I'll give you just like a stupid example. You just see it all the NFL, the NBA, these are stupid examples to give, but they're examples of where society has gone, right? In the NBA, you used to have to get hit and bleed to get a foul. Nowadays, you touch the guy, it's a foul. And then I the same thing, right? These are just stupid examples of where society has, for the most part, just shifted a little bit. You know, it used to be, you played, like at the NBA now, anyone has like a finger problem, they they sit out 30 games a year. It used to be you got the hell on the court. You're getting paid $30 million a year. You right. showed the hell up. Now it's like, well, load management, they have all these different things. I'm just giving you a sports example just because it's the first sure thing that guy. comes to mind. And guy give, guys give sports examples. Right. It's exactly really that sexist too. of you to say it. I really well, appreciate it. It's just your frame of reference. <laughs> <laughs> your reference. So I'm just saying like, uh, there's a lot of that, right, okay. overall. And I'm just saying, where does that toughness come in where people have to like have that grit? And Can you then, build toughness out of unconditional love and out of that sort of coddling? So I don't think that leads to coddling. I think it actually leads to strength. I think that those are the people that are most likely people who feel good about themselves. They are, they have confidence. Their self would be very intact and they're most likely to be successful in dealing with anything. All of these things that life Get throws at way. you. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you don't see an over sense pointed, of that these days? No. As you pointed out, um, people often are in, you know, reach whatever, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. They never got that. And so what happened to them? Some people have really compensated. This is the protector parts that I was talking about. And they became enormously successful and enormously tough. And they have created empires and families. And at some point, their these protector parts wind up getting in the way because those parts that were so wounded still need our attention. And at some point, we hope to be able to do that for them. Um, and sometimes people don't survive and thrive at all. And, you know, they're not so functional. And they, you know, really aren't able to. I, I don't know... I don't think we've isolated what is it that in the same family you could see people who obviously had the same parents and the same, you know, crises and, and problems and instability. And yet, you know, people, if you look at the siblings, people respond, you know, very differently. So maybe it has something to do with nature, nurture. You know, that debate's been going on and will go on forever. You say that they go on to build empires and things of that nature and they have this tough appearance. What is there a way to do both? Pay attention to the, the damaged inner child and go on to create that empire in a healthy way? Right. I mean, it would be interesting. I'm asking for myself, by the way. Yeah. I, I mean, I would imagine that if you can get that part taken care of at any age, the younger you would do it, the better it would be, because then you can go on to create whatever you wanted to create, including your relationships. And then they wouldn't be, you know, th then these other parts wouldn't necessarily have to take over in order for you to do that. So they could like your perfectionistic part, right? That could be really helpful with anything that you would do. But if it takes over, maybe you drive people crazy and push them away. So if we can deal with, you know, one, then you have all the good from that part without any of the negative. Right. But you're saying being wildly ambitious in and of itself is obviously like you're not saying that to you doesn't is not necessarily a problem. Right. So the people who come to me that are wildly ambitious and wildly successful mm -hmm. and sometimes wildly generous in terms of the um, chesed and um, money and, you know, charity that they give, um, they're only coming to me if there's something about that ambition that is, is when it takes over, impacts those around them. Or sometimes themselves, burn out and stress. That's a big one. They do. They can burn out. They can hurt people around them. Um, you know, when when you've got, you know, 
all of the success, but you can usually see it in people. Unfortunately, you sometimes see it later, which is why get help earlier. Because if you see it later, it's because, you know, they, you see it like they're driving themselves and driving themselves and they're not taking time to take care of their health. They're not taking time to spend time with their family. They're not taking time with the spiritual component, just all across the board. Why is that happening? Well, a lot of times it, it pertaining to I mean, our where's discussion. That, where's that if, drive coming from? So if it's not coming from just the self that wants to be, you know, competent and courageous actualize. and all of that and actualize. Um, if it's coming from, um, I've got to prove something to myself or somebody else. Um, if it's coming from a part that has learned to survive, not just actualize, then that's where it's, that's where we want to help, right? Because we want you to have a full life. We want you to be able to have a great career and a great family and still take care of yourself physically and spend time in spiritual pursuits and, and have balance. Got it. Got it. Let's say, okay. Let's say I have a few other questions. I'm not going to make this a personal therapy session for myself, People despite, despite wanting to. <laughs> when I did Sonny's um, podcast, we lapsed right into a session and he right in the podcast with him as the client. And people were very into it. So no, I love this. Into your I, experience. I'll tell you straight. I love this conversation. I'll tell you honestly, you're not telling me anything particularly. I've been in therapy 11 years. I've been to some, all the therapists I know that I've been to, you know who they are. And they're of the better ones. So nothing you're telling me is particularly surprising. But I always like hearing it from one more person. Just to remind myself how <laughs> far, how much I need to just pay attention to this. Um, okay. One other thing. So the new in thing in the last 12 months, I always like to talk about the new in thing. Cause like you said, fads are fads and people love to jump on them. Like, and then people like yeah. to just use them. Like it's a cool thing. So they like, they show they're up to date, but I actually want to get into this. I think it's an extremely important thing. Narcissism and gaslighting. That concept has been, I don't know. Nowadays you just walk in the street. Oh, you're gaslighting me. Oh, you're whatever. I know. I don't like it at all. I think it, Personally, I don't know why I'm giving my opinion here, but I'll just do it. I feel the same way with the word abuse. Interesting. Explain that, please. When people say, I've been abused, I say, tell me about that. And then I want to really clarify. And even with verbal abuse, I like to make a differential. Even with verbal abuse, there's a differential between somebody who's mean and nasty versus somebody who's verbally abusive. I'm careful for the same reason. We can cheapen it. Can when you explain the what's the between, line? How yeah, mean on. can I be? Verbal and that, right. Verbal abuse versus <laughs> right. mean and nasty. Right. Again, you could talk to somebody who's a domestic violence expert, which I am not. But so on the mean and nasty would be things like, um, you know, just saying, get it yourself. I don't, I'm not really interested in spending time with you. Why are you always doing that? Just mean, nasty. That's not abuse. Abuse is, there's a power differential, let's say. And so somebody bigger, like the husband, is screaming at the wife. And so screaming when, with the power differential is abuse. Screaming is automatically abuse? Screaming with the power differential. Well, all, every and, man is going to have and, a power and, differential. And putting your wife, that, so that's attached to, and putting your wife down. So let's say, for example, use that differential. You're hovering over your wife. You are screaming at her and putting her down. That's going to be verbal abuse. Yes. What about from a distance? What does that make a difference? If it was on the phone? What I'm saying is that adults often when they get angry, raise their voices. And I think if we were going to call every husband who has ever yelled when he got angry at his kids, which is a power difference or his children, an abuser, that's a very right. hefty statement. That's why I'm trying to give a bigger picture. So there's a power So differential. you wouldn't consider gas, like real gaslighting verbal abuse? So that's a different gas thing? Gaslighting is something totally different. And so I really am surprised to hear you using them um, um, interchangeably. interchangeably. I'm not, it's not verbal abuse. I got it. I mean, to me, I would have just said verbal abuse is like, doesn't have to be raising voice. It could just be like, you're telling your kid he's a piece of shit. I, I would just think so, that's verbal abuse. Right. So like, cursing. Screaming with the power differential, Just demoting putting your self -esteem. down, right? Things that are really uh, erode self-esteem. Yeah. 
Um, but, you know, cursing is a big one, you know, to me and, you know, obviously threatening kind of behavior, which is not necessarily, I haven't touched you, but I've approached you and I'm hovering over you and I'm maybe making a fist. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, there's you're painting a specific one, picture. Yeah. Threatening. Yeah. Threatening is another big piece of this. When it's threatening, if you don't, then I won't give you money. Mm. I will lock you in the room. I won't give you access to the car or the kids or the, I mean, these threatening is a very, very big one. You What's know, that a goes good along. thing for someone to do, especially the person who's going to have the power and balance, who's going to have the power. And they know they're like, I tend to get angry and they have triggers. How do they, what are some good tips for them to be able to take a beat so that they do not end up becoming threatening or being abusive? So I am they not just, how an they diffuse expert anger? in anger management. You know, obviously I could look at it from an IFS perspective. I, yeah, let's look at I it from an IFS. Let's and I do, and I look at this as your anger part. And so let's understand how why do you that love the anger part? So upset. Yeah. You know, well, first let's understand it. Let's understand, you know, what and anger is, in my opinion, always, which is a big statement, a secondary emotion that's the there to protect some other vulnerable emotion. Or grief, shame. Right. And so if I can do that and help somebody really be with the underlying emotion, the more mm -hmm. vulnerable emotion. That's very interesting. I always hear people say that, and I've always tried understanding that always. That when someone gets angry, that's a secondary emotion. Like I see other people, I don't know, I, I, sometimes There's I'm like- something deeper underneath. But sometimes I'm like, I, I don't get what's deeper underneath. Like in that particular situation, that particular thing that the person's getting angry. I mean, I can understand how- the anger is finally the straw that broke the camel's back, but within what is going on, like let's say Zach does something stupid, right? And Which I would never happen. And I blow a gasket on him. But the real reason why I'm blowing a gasket, it's not what anything Zach did, it's just previous things that happened in my day. So how would you sum up that the anger is a secondary emotion? Because I'm not angry at him about anything other than right. hey, so, a mistake, whatever. So as as you're thinking about that, so you know what we would think about what feeling is underneath that. So you were spending this whole day, things weren't going well. Yeah, let's you say you were hurt. It's fear. You were afraid. It's, just, it's well, fear. Fear is is the most common. It's word anger. Underneath. Got it. And so I would help you be okay with being with your fear part. Mm. After, of course, spending time with the anger part. So. Because it needs validate the attention that. too and yeah. to validate that. And then if you go through life and then, you know, you start recognizing, oh, here's my fear part. I had such a crummy day. Or here's my anger part. I wonder what's beneath it. And let me spend time with these two parts. I don't beat up Zach or kick the dog when I get him. I wonder how many fights between lovers, married couples, anyone in a relationship would be stopped in their tracks if when the emotions rose, someone had the wherewithal to say, yeah. I am scared right now yeah. that you are not going to love me. I'm scared that you're going to leave me because I've made mistakes. And now I'm getting angry because I'm covering up for that fear. Go. I mean, imagine that saying that to someone's face. Work on yourself. To well, tell someone that, you're, that, it, that, that you know you did something wrong to and now you're getting into a fight yeah. and they're bringing up all the things you did and you it's go, doable, I'm just scared. It's doable. So it's the goal of the couples therapy that I do, which is called IFIO, which intimacy from the inside out grows also out of IFS. I like that name. I know. You came up with like, that? No, no, no. Tony Irvine Blank, um, who also worked with Dick Schwartz, the founder of IFS. Have you she, met Mr. Schwartz, Dr. Schwartz? I bet. Yeah, I was in more intimate settings. He, he came um, once to Manhattan not so long ago. Are all the people involved in IFS Jewish? I have to. No. <laughs> no, they're not. Okay. It's worldwide at this okay. point. Um, I've just taken somatic IFS and feel very dedicated to bringing it to the Orthodox community and the um, Nefesh, which is an organization. Yeah, sure. You know, Nefesh. They, just, they do every year, right? A conference? They no. do a conference, but they also, maybe five or six years ago, spoke with the IFS people that be, powers that be, and they brought a Shabbos friendly IFS week mm. to Brooklyn and then a uh, six months later another week. And so we're really and then I'm doing that with somatic IFS and Susan's probably gonna come. Susan is coming in November. Oh, wow. So we can Rav David yeah. Cohen is the one who does that, right? He's like the rabbi there. I think that's like who oversees it officially Nefesh. Cameron's. I don't know. I thought anyways, another question that I think Zach is gonna like a lot actually, and you could actually be help for this. I'm curious to hear your take. Therapy is very expensive. Right. I do like this question. 
I knew he would like this question, right? <sighs> and there's a lot of people that need therapy. I would say that most people probably could benefit from it, from working on themselves and having conversations about how they're operating. How is there a way to make it more accessible in your opinion? Um, or do you, to you, this is like any healthcare system, just like right. it's the same concept. Like right. you pay for a doctor, you pay for this. Right. So, um, you know, you started off by saying that I've been busy and so is there, so is everybody else. I mean, it, today I used to do a lot of, um, um, evaluations and then I would have somebody find a therapist. I don't do that anymore because I, nobody's got any room. Nobody. No, Are I mean, there not enough and, therapists? And, and by the way, since a lot of my trainings have been online and people from all over the world, also nobody has room. Australia, South Korea, Israel, UK. I mean, everybody. The, the when you say health, nobody has room, you're talking about the therapists. Therapists. And you're talking about, I assume, the good ones that you approve of. I, these are people who have been online with me in training. So these are people What's who go on? on for more trainings. Well, COVID Why? didn't help. I mean, oh, everyone, there's just a lot more people who are seeking therapy. Everyone right got fucked up during COVID. Simple as that. Sorry for my French. I apologize. That's okay. I've heard it before. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're dealing with 16-year-olds who are angry, so I would assume. <laughs> um, used to, at least. Um, I'm just 28 and angry, so I'm just going to hear the same thing. <laughs> Sorry. No, but... Yeah. So, so what's the answer? I mean, we need better therapists. So I'll tell you what I do, but, and I think most therapists do something like this. I see four clients for free, making it 10%. When I had 40 clients, I, I think I don't have, you know, but that's what I do. You took on four clients for free. Right. Now I'm trying to make them pay $25 because somebody reminded me, which is true that they should pay something. For sure. Um, you know, to, to be invested. And yeah. I'm sure all therapists do this thing called sliding scale. This is not something that I do uniquely. Um, I think people also donate their time, you know, maybe in other ways. I don't know if you know Relief Resources. Yeah, sure. Of course I know them. So th I think they Shout out also, Dan Berman from LA. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I spoke he, to him once looking he's for great. a he's therapist fantastic. in LA for somebody. Yeah, he's very good. So I know Relief has a clinic that they have developed with really, you know, good clinicians and the whole idea is they do what other places can't do. In the big picture, this is what we need more of. What we need is we need the way things are set up now is that financially, if you pay therapist peanuts at a clinic, they finish their three years of mandatory work to get their license. And then they're going to leave because why should they continue to work for peanuts? There's way more money in private practice. Right. So if you can... Pay, pay them you know, better. And that's what I think Relief did. I don't know the name of their clinic, but, you know, they set up this clinic and they paid people enough, a, a, a decent livable, set, you know, wage. It's not so worth it to go open up the private there. practice. Right? Or maybe they'll do both. A little longer. Right. Or maybe they'll do both. Yeah. At least, you know, maybe it's not as much as I would make, but I want to give back to the community. So mm. I'm going to do a few hours or a half a day wow. or, you know, whatever. So that's the kind of thing that I think we need more of. Yeah, I, I hope I'm getting this York. right. Maybe you should have somebody from Relief on your. I'm talking about these people. I'm thinking maybe you should go directly to them. Uh, one thing I want to go backwards a little bit. Zach hates when I do this, but just one thing because I don't feel like I got a clear answer. Social media, today's generation. What, what effects are you seeing? Uh, we spoke Not about really an expert on that. I, okay. I, I don't. I think maybe somebody else would know more than I would. I wanted to go back on gaslighting. <laughs> oh, please. Yes. I was thinking that, but I didn't want to play. I really want to hear your take on that. I just. Because first of all, I want to ask you, 28 year old, if, if you know where the term gaslighting. I very much do. Gas 19, stoves. 19, 19, 1942 movie, turning the lights on and off. Was it the lights? It was the gas. Lights. Was the gas lights? I don't know. The gas lights. Did you I want... research this? <laughs> yes. Gas I know where it's called. There, yes. I know the entire term of gas lights. There was electricity. So there the were lights. gas lights. <laughs> and gas lights, as you turn them she on would and say, off, go brighter and so right. like a dimmer right, right. the right and so and he, he did to his wife she would he would make it lower and she would say did why did you make it lower just, what and he would say about? what are you talking about it's not okay. true oh. okay so the reason i wanted you to say that because i don't know that everybody knows what mm -hmm. gaslighting is mm -hmm. so gaslighting obviously is is used to try to make people crazy. Erode their perception of reality, effectively. To, to, right, to warp their perception of reality. Mm -hmm. So the way that I'm hearing it so much, as you said, definitely the in thing, 
you know, I'm like, I had an argument with, with my husband and I said, you know, that first you're supposed to do X and second, you're supposed to do Y. And, and he, he said, argued with way. me. Gonna... No, it was Y and then X. Look, he's gaslighting me. That is not gaslighting. Gaslighting is very serious. And, and, and similar to what you said before about abuse, let's not be throwing these terms around. To accuse somebody of gaslighting you means they are purposely setting out to make you think you are crazy. Well, it's a high, high level of manipulation also. Yes. Some, some, some narcissists naturally have learned the tendency of gaslighting, I would think. Just it comes instinctually to them in order to win arguments and, and really, you know, get in people's heads. I don't even know if it's something that they are trying to do. They, they just learned the skill and learned yeah. that it wins them. Also not my expertise, narcissist. Yeah, I'm just. So I can't speak so yeah, much I mean, to that the, and guess Labels, something. expertise. No, I'm just saying at the end of the day. I hear that. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> so is he. At the end of the day, though, I, I think that the. Someone, I think the real key in gaslighting, you can tell me if you agree with me or not, um, is that someone arguing with you and saying that this occurred first or that occurred first, um, there could be a difference of opinion. That's not necessarily gaslighting. Gaslighting is the, the key factor is the consistency of the, the, the difference of events and the back and forth of events. Meaning if, if you could almost, uh, there's a person on YouTube that explained this very well. Dr. Romani, her name is Romani Dervasala. She says, if you ever start thinking to yourself that I, and start getting in your head that I need to carry around the tape recorder with myself to record this person, to show them that what they're saying is not true because I know what I'm saying is true. That's how you know you're being consistently gaslit. Because uh, Couldn't that just be a crazy person? What do you mean? Not necessarily doing it to drive you crazy, but they themselves are confused and they're changing the things that they say. I mean, I guess in what, what do you mean? Specifically what? That they- Well, the example that you gave. Mm -hmm. Here, I carry around a, a, a- If you find yourself thinking that because you're constantly in a fight and every single time you're in a fight with yeah. the person, the person says, what, what you just said didn't happen. The way you presented yeah. the argument that happened didn't really occur. You did this first and then I did that, which you're thinking to yourself, that's a total lie. That's totally not true. And you start asking, is that what actually happened, right? Because they get in your head. So See, a lot of times people start- a bad example. Why? Because to me, when people get angry, and uh, th their memories aren't the same. They get confused. Oh, is that like on a biological level? Yeah. Like it's messed with this, their- Hold on, go on. They get confused. They mm -hmm. can start having an argument. I remember it one way. My spouse remembers it another way. Everybody's upset. I, I don't know that in that situation, the person- I don't think a one-time thing. That's why I said the consistency of it is no, the very big key. The consistency of it happening in an argument would convince me that this couple needed therapy. I would not. Go right to gaslight. So how would you say, so in your opinion, not, how would you say? I mean, I'm not the expert. People should look it up. But to me, it's actually much more subtle. Is not something, at least in the movie, not something that happens in the middle of an argument. A person is setting out to make you think you're crazy. That is not in the middle of an argument. So I, maybe I'm using it too restrictive. Harsh, they're saying. But- you know, if I were, there's not one couple that I've ever worked with. And this is why IFIO does not talk about what happened. You do not go backwards ever mm. and say, tell me about your weekend, your last argument. And the reason is because nobody ever remembers it the same. You've got your own emotions. You've got years of, of contact with this person. And so you've got tons of expectations. Your system is ready and and you're gonna your system might react to something like oh you're you're being um, you know I'm I'm feeling that you're getting angry right now now that person may not be getting angry right now but for years you got angry with me and so my system is ramping up and it's expecting anger there's history there's so many things I don't know to go I mean, right away to gaslighting is, uh, just to elaborate maybe a little that. bit further. Uh, to me, the only way to move forward, though, in a relationship is when there's an agreement on the factual truth of what is actually existing. That means if, if you were telling me that you if I was telling you you were here on a Monday and you were telling me you were here on a Sunday and we were fighting about that, you would not be able to move forward. You wouldn't care what therapy and therapist we were sitting in front of. It wouldn't work because there's such a disagreement on the specifics of the actual reality we're in. So if you have someone that's constantly screwing with your reality in that type of way, the only way to move forward, I mean, it's very nice you don't want to move backwards, but there's no way to, especially in my, in 
my experience with dealing with, with the narcissism, it's very, very, very difficult because you're always on different playing fields. You can never really trust and, and you're always on eggshells because they're always throwing something out of left field at you that, hey, by the way, that's not what occurred. You know, it, it just, it, the reality gets very skewed as far as what is going on around you and what yeah. you're experiencing. I don't know. This is uh, what well, I've seen I would from go, other people. You know, with what Zach was saying earlier, you know, if, if you get to a point, you can get a couple to a point where somebody could say, um, you know, it's really hard for me to feel like I could move forward because we remember things so differently. And, and I just, I can't trust because you're seeing it one way and I'm seeing it another way. Yeah. So we can have a discussion about trust or we could have a discussion about other vulnerabilities, but to go back and forth between, was it Sunday or Wednesday or Sunday or Wednesday? It's not going to help anyone. It's not going to help. Two quick, 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 quick questions. Quick. Um, favorite public therapist slash influencer therapist in the therapy space right now? Susan McConnell. Is she like a Peterson? Like, well, she's not going to be as big as Peterson, right. but she's, she's she's big. Susan McConnell's your person, okay? Uh, favorite book on trauma that's a must read, and why? So many books on trauma. Are we? I see the favorite one. That was the idea. Right, but are you talking for lay people? Or are you talking lay for people. a client? Both. Let's just. Why They're not? very different. They're very mm. different. So, for example, No Bad Parts is great for lay people, and that's by and Dick Schwartz. Ton, that's Dick Schwartz. But then there are tons of IFS books that are more like textbook for therapists. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about for someone like myself. Body Keeps Score. Body Keeps Score. Um, I don't think we have a really good somatic book yet for the- Peter Levine. Oh, Peter, Peter Levine, Levine's the Awakening the Tiger. Right, Awakening the Tiger. Yeah. Awakening the Tiger, yeah. yeah. He started yeah. somatic experience. Susan hasn't done one yet for- What the, about you? Are you coming people? up with a book? Definitely not. Definitely, Definitely not. not. Why? Def Didn't you I'm say that about going? Six years old. So. And I know what young. I am doing and what I am not doing. It's a great place to be. <laughs> that does sound like a very <laughs> enjoyable yeah, place. Like, that place. So, <laughs> I have. I don't want to do it tomorrow. I'm I have <laughs> my private practice. I have our place, and I'm dedicated to spreading somatic. We look IFS. forward to the book coming out. <laughs> and I am never going to write. You are putting out. You're content with where your life is. I so am sorry. content with my life. Uh, Doctor. Trish, Atiyah, thank you so, so much for coming on. I really Having greatly me. appreciate it. Not just that, Trish came all the way from Brooklyn? Westchester. Westchester to Ooh. our studio. By the way, you're the first person here. And that's awesome. Thank and you we, for blessing the new studio. We're really thankful. And by the way, I really enjoyed this conversation thoroughly. Yeah. Yeah. I gave thoroughly, a lot. Thoroughly. It was really nice. I awesome. Maybe you could get back. a Susan McDonald, McDonald Susan on our McConnell. Let's, get McConnell. McConnell. Let's get her on. She's pretty clear about what she does also. I don't think podcasts podcast are is part it? of it, but I'll see when she's in Brooklyn if she uh, beautiful to, could be amazing. Yeah, beautiful. That would be awesome. Thank you so much. You've right, given me you. and I'm sure label yeah. a lot to think about, and we really appreciate yeah. it. I have a lot to think about. When are we meeting? <laughs> <laughs>